the magic hour of seven o'clock has arrived, so I think it's time for us to get started. We have a, a pretty interesting program, I think, ahead of us tonight, and I and I know we want to hear all the good information tonight. So um, I'm Eleanor Ravel. I'm the council member for the seventh ward, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this special topic meeting where we're going to learn about three um, substantive issues that are related to the con proposed concerts at the new stadium. So we're going to have an in-depth look at both the sound issues, the parking issues, and the concert management issues. And then we're also going to hear from Matt Rogers, um, chair of the Land Use Commission, to talk about the process, the, the, the process that the Land Use Commission will go through and the what the opportunities will be for for you all to share your thoughts about the, the proposals. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I guess I'm going to start with Matt Rogers. <laughs> um, so Matt is the, as I just mentioned, is the chair of the Land Use Commission and um, his commission will be um, holding at least a couple of meetings to just to learn about and discuss and consider and issue recommendations about the uh, proposed stadium proposal and the concert proposal. So Matt, uh, turn it over there. Thank you, Council Member Ravel. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Matt Rogers. I'm the chair of the Land Use Commission. Um, the Land Use Commission is a, an appointed commission of the city of Evanston. We're appointed by the mayor and approved by city council. We are uh, nine volunteers who have backgrounds in everything from planning, architecture, um, engineering, things along those lines. Um, and we are the body which has the public hearing. So we conduct the public hearing. All the information is then passed along to city council in matters in which we are a recommending body, which we are in this particular case. Um, the way it typically works is we have, a, um, everybody should receive an announcement for the hearing. Um, if you live within a thousand feet, you'll get a postcard uh, mailed from the city and it will announce the date and time. I don't know the exact date and time yet because I've been told it may be a little flexible. Um, but what we will do on that evening is we will ask the applicant, which in this case is Northwestern University, to please present their project to us. There are two different aspects to the project that we are going to be reviewing. The first one is a text amendment, meaning we will actually change the, we will make a recommendation for changing um, the language in the zoning ordinance or denying that change. Um, and that is to allow concerts within the U2 zoning district. So um, I'm going to kind of assume that most people know a little bit about zoning here, because otherwise I'll just take forever. And I don't think the council member will let me do that. Um, so when we when we do hear the hearing, we will hear the two aspects together, both the the actual change to the ordinance and the proposal, which would be um, a special use in the U2 district. Um, we are bound by a number of standards, and those are set out in the city ordinance. Um, for a text amendment, there are four standards that we must find or met. For a special use, there are nine. If we find any one of those standards is not met, we cannot make a positive recommendation to city council. Um, but we are also within our authority to put conditions on anything that we recommend and then city council has the ability to either take those recommendations and those uh, conditions and put them forward or they can deny it. Um, again, since we are recommending, we can recommend yes or no. And city council can either recommend the exact, or city council can either make the determination yes or no, or go against the recommendation that we put forward. They are the final decider. Um, when making arguments to us, and this is kind of what I want to do, um, is give you the blueprint for making the best arguments to us, whether you're for it or against it. Um, coming to us with vague generalities doesn't help us in our decision making. Um, there are also certain things that we have no control over. I know Northwestern doesn't pay property taxes. I can't change that. Um, so coming and making an argument to the Land Use Commission that property taxes should be paid by Northwestern is not something that we can even consider. Um, the things that we can consider, and I'll just run through them briefly and just kind of give a, a brief uh, oversight as to what each one means. I mean, looking at text amendments are whether the proposed amendment is considered consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive general plan. Um, we do have a comprehensive general plan, which is the guiding document for all zoning in the city. 
Um, and we have to make sure that, that whatever is being proposed fits within that. Um, whether it's compatible with the overall character of the existing development in the immediate vicinity of the subject property. So that's, does it fit in with the neighborhood around it? Um, what impact does it have on that? Uh, whether the proposed amendment has an adverse effect on the value of adjacent property. So will neighboring properties see property values diminish um, or will they see a change? No change. And that's one's, that one's a little tricky because we get a lot of people who come to the commission and say, I have a feeling my property, my property value is going to go down. Um, that's kind of an opinion and we can take that and look at it, but obviously anything that people can provide to us that is expert testimony, documentation, things along those lines definitely helps with that. Um, and the last one is the adequacy of public facilities and services. So this is really like, you know, the infrastructure around the building um, in this particular case. How does it fit in? Do we have to put in new roads? Do we have to put in um, additional plumbing, fire, uh, suppression, anything like that? The standards for special uses are much more general. Some of them kind of overlap. The first one being it's a specific special use in the zoning ordinance. So what we would do is if the first change to the text amendment does not pass, then obviously that standard isn't met. So the special use would not pass. Um, so the two, as I said, kind of run together side by side. So when we hear them, we will hear them side by side, but we will take separate votes the first vote will be on the text amendment. The second vote will be on the special use. Um, number two of special use standards is that it is in keeping with the purposes and policies of the adopted comprehensive general plan. This kind of reflects the same thing that we just talked about in the text amendment change. Um, number three, it will not cause a negative cumulative effect when its effect is considered in conjunction with the cumulative effect of various special uses of all types on the immediate neighborhood. Again, this is what is the impact that it has on the on the neighboring properties. Um, number four, it does not interfere with or diminish the value of property in the neighborhood. Again, that's kind of a repeat from the text amendment. Um, number five, it can be adequately served by public facilities and services. Again, this goes back to the, is there enough electricity coming to the property? Is there um, infrastructure built to support uh, whatever's being proposed? Um, number six is, does it cause in undue traffic congestions? So this is where we look at traffic planning. Um, and this is one that's always a big issue in Evanston because we always have traffic issues no matter where you are. Um, so that's something that we would be considering um, is what would be the traffic impact on the neighborhood and on the city as a whole. Um, number seven is that it preserves significant historical and architectural resources. Um, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Number eight, preserve significant natural and environmental features. Um, again, pretty self-explanatory. And the last one being that it, it complies with all other applicable regulations of the city. Um, so those are the things that we will consider when we have this before our commission. And those are the standards that we will be, be looking at. So these are all in the city ordinance. Um, so you can find them there if you don't if you need help finding them there you can do a search uh, through the city website or i'm going to put it on staff you can reach out to staff um, they can tell you where they are exactly in the ordinance or council member Ravel is also saying you can reach out to her when we hear big cases like this we have a lot of people show up um, because of that we have limited time and so just like at city council meetings where people are limited to their speaking time, we do the same thing for land use commission. So my suggestion is if you want to make your opinion heard, submit it in writing beforehand, plenty of time beforehand. Um, and we do read those when they come to us with the packet of information. So your, your, your comments will be made. You also can come to the meeting and make simple comments. Just say, I'm, I'm in favor of this, I'm opposed to this, and here's a two sentence reason as to why. Um, obviously, again, having you know 100 people show up, we cannot hear from 100 people. Um, for Northwestern, since I'm, not talk since I'm seeing most of you for the first time this evening, um, I will also let you know I'm going to limit your time. <laughs> um, the chair has the, the prerogative to limit the presentation time. Um, so I've talked with staff and I'm going to ask Northwestern to please keep their presentation when they come before our board to about 30 minutes. Um, everything can be submitted in writing. We will engage in discussion afterward, um, but that's to, to sort of 
prevent you from just reading a 100 page submittal to us. Um, and then we'll ask the same for for any of the citizens. You know, if you if you've submitted something to us in writing, just get up and say, I've submitted in writing. Here's something I'd like to add to that. Um, I think that's kind of the overview of what we have and how kind of it moves through when we make our recommendation, um, either positive or negative, it will move on to planning and development city council and they will conduct their hearing. Um, but again, due to their time time limitations on presenting and everything, your best chance to be heard is before the land use commission. Um, so I encourage you all to do that. Um, Evanston is a very civically engaged community. Um, that's good. That's bad. I'll let you kind of weigh the, the pluses and minuses of that. Um, but we do like to hear from the citizens. We do encourage you to come out and speak to the commission and share your opinions because we are from different parts of the city, all of us. Um, and so we like to sort of hear from the people who are immediately impacted. But things like this also um, impact the, the entire city as a whole. So, yes. Um, so when you mentioned the first standard for the special use for the uh, plan development itself, it sounded like you said the the way you would consider that depended a little bit on what you decided about the zoning amendment. Yeah. So the the text amendment has to pass, or we have to make a recommendation for approval of the text amendment. If we don't think the text amendment should go forward, then obviously when we reach the the uh, standard as to whether or not it's something that's allowed in the district, we feel that it should not be allowed in the district. So we would make a negative vote on that as well. Does that make sense? Um, but but that wouldn't mean you would vote uh, not to recommend the whole plan development. If we find one standard is not met, we have to recommend denial. Okay, because I guess I would have uh, thought you could. We can condition. We, we can, can condition things, or, or that you could recommend you could recommend against the zoning amendment for the concerts, but still want to recommend for the stadium plan development itself. Yeah. We we could, but my understanding, again, I've not seen the application and I can't really talk to okay. specifics about things, but if my understanding is that the main reason for the text amendment change is to accommodate the plan for the special development. And again, I've not right. seen it and yeah, I can't right. I can't get yeah. into a lot of details sure, because sure, it will right. come to us. I can't sure right. Discuss yeah. in okay, yeah. Um, well, that's obviously going to need some further discussion and clarification because that and and, it, and and when we come to the meeting, that sure. will all become much more sure, clear once right. we're in it once we're in a right, hearing. Yeah. Um, so, um, so there would there not be an opportunity, let's say, for a group of residents kind of to have a like a rebuttal of I mean more more than just an opportunity to say one or two minutes worth of comments, some kind of organized presentation from. So we do we do have under our rules the ability for a community organization to present mm -hmm. on behalf of a community organization. Mm -hmm. If someone is interested in doing that, um, they have to reach out to staff before the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some guidelines. Staff can give some guidance as to exactly what what we need to hear from someone before the determination is made whether or not they get to make a special presentation we've had situations where we've had like two or three neighbors who get together and say hey we're the you know the neighborhood association and we want 10 minutes to speak mm -hmm. um bigger projects like this obviously there there are organizations that right. form around this right. so we would be much more accommodating mm -hmm. to those sorts of things right. Right. Okay. and then um so in terms of the hearing part so the public hearing will will you will hear from the, from the university about both the concert proposal and the plan development stadium proposal so that that 30 minutes will cover both of those correct topics and then the public will have this opportunity to give their thoughts about either the concerts or the stadium or both correct so it's all it's all part of one. it's sort of one got giant hearing it's one giant hearing because in, in situations like this it's very hard to separate out one from mm -hmm. the other okay. Um, and, and once people start speaking, they kind of start speaking about both of them. Sure. And so our experience has been that when we get a text amendment and a plan development that come together or a special use that come together, 
uh, that we hear them as one thing, but then when we take our vote, we do vote separately right. on one versus the other. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Matt. Sure. Um, I'm sure we will, uh, res residents will presumably have some follow-up questions, and I I know where to find you. And you know where to find <laughs> me. Um, also, you can always reach me through the staff at the zoning right. okay. department as well, mm -hmm. um, and they will they will send everything forward everything on to me mm -hmm. and or the other commissioners. All right, great. Okay, well, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, so now, now we'll turn to the substantive issues um, tonight to learn more about uh, different aspects of the concert. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to be turning it over to Dave Davis to introduce our, our panelists, our special um, uh, consultants who have come, some of them from a distance, to be with us this evening. So um, I think all of you really know Dave Davis, but I'll just say um, officially um, that he is the senior executive director uh, for neighborhood and community relations, and he's the person who, in, who interacts with the higher up administration at the university about all manner of issues. Um, you may not know that he's also uh, the lead, the university's lead on signature social justice programs in Evanston, which are uh, really making an important difference in the community. Um, he works to um, you know, promote meaningful partnerships between community members and the university. Um, and I was going to say one more thing. Um, it, yeah, basically, he's, a, he's the university's ambassador to the community, and um, he's certainly um, been a very visible presence in all of these presentations about the proposed stadium. So, Dave, I'm going to ask you to introduce our first, first panelist. Thank you, Council Member Vell. You actually stole on my thunder. That was the nicest introduction I've had for quite a while, so I appreciate it. And good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see all the faces, all of the different opinions in this room today. My role is relatively short. Um, our focus primarily today is to talk to you specifically about the items that we've heard. Um, we've been out there, we've been listening, we understand there are some concerns about the project. And we're gonna spend some time today really diving into the details and getting the facts out there. But before I get started, I just wanna share a little bit about the Ryan Field Stadium where we are today as a project. I think across this room, there's universal agreement, which doesn't happen often in Evanston, that our stadium is in a significant state of disrepair and that repairs to the stadium are long overdue. I think that there's also agreement here that if you drive by 1501 Central Avenue on any given evening, that it's empty. And in fact, 95% of the year, that space is empty. And so what the university is proposing is to use that space in different ways that can bring the community together. And you've probably heard me talk in the past at the other community events about the different types of gatherings we're trying to convene, as such as a, you know, an ice skating ring, um, a yoga session. We've also talked about doing a sleepover inside the stadium. Now, these are all opportunities for us to bring people together here in the Evanston community. We want this to serve more than just an athletic facility, but a place that people could come together and build community and really strengthen community cohesion. And so that's our proposal today, is that we want to develop a stadium campus that brings the Evanston community together in a way, but also serves us for the next 100 years. And we're also excited about the economic impact of our stadium. We made an ambitious goal that we would spend 35% of the stadium investment with women, local and minority owned businesses. And we intend to make due on that commitment. So our proposal again is simple. We're trying to use our facility for more than seven days a year. It currently sits empty for over 95% of the days each and every year. And so if I look around the room, again, I see some supporters. If there are supporters in this room, I would say continue to work with us to make sure this venue becomes everything that we can envision it to be for the future of Evanston. If there are folks that are in this room that oppose the project and you oppose it because you don't think we have a strong enough plan to prevent against any kind of community harm or that it might somehow degrade your quality of life, I simply say, give us a chance. Hear us out today, hear our presenters, and listen to our plans and how we feel that it would help mitigate some of those challenges. 
And then finally, if there are people in here that have a moral disagreement or strong conviction that this project would impact their lives negatively, I say continue to work with us, continue to talk to us. We have an opportunity to do something special here in Evanston. And so with that said, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Michael Godoy. Michael is a highly effective operations executive at CAI Icon with over 30 years of experience in the management of sports and entertainment venue. He has a comprehensive background of not only coordinating a virus variety of sports and entertainment events, but also leading day-to-day -day facility operations, including design, construction, and capital planning for over 75 valued, for over 75 projects valued at $7 billion. CAI Icon has managed the development of many of the most successful stadium marine and projects in the world and has experience in planning, activating, designing, constructing, and commissioning projects from MLS, NFL, NBA, NHL, and MLB franchises totaling $40 billion, including over 2,000 consulting engagements. Michael? Thank you for that. Um, I actually get to talk about something I love, and that's how sports, entertainment, public assembly brings people together. Um, over my 30 years, we ran through it, and I hope a lot of you are saying, wow, he doesn't look like he's been in the business that long. Um, I have been in the sports venue management space um, for that entire time. Uh, for about eight of those years, I was at a venue. Uh, I was at three NFL stadiums in three different communities, uh, experiencing much of what I think has been talked about before I came here today. Um, I reside in Tampa, Florida. So I, I, I am one of those that came from a distance to be with you here tonight. And I was asked tonight to come and talk about the concert business. I'm sorry. And I was asked to kind of go into a day in the life or explain what occurs at a stadium during a concert and the days leading up to a concert. So we tried to encapsulate a lot of the points that I'm about to go through here on, on the screen here. Um, if, if I may, and pardon me if many of you know this, I'm assuming that, uh, that there are some that do not know some of these intricacies with, with which are specific to our industry. And so I'm gonna go into it in a bit of a fundamental kind of no, uh, layman's explanation of what happens. Um, there are those that represent the artists that tour and play in different venues across the country. And I'll use terms like touring show, that's referring to that type of event. Um, there are other events that are homegrown events or one-off events is a term that's often used. And those are organically created within the community. Perhaps it's a battle of the band, it's local entertainers, local artists. That's a different type of event that might occur in a venue like a stadium. So, in the industry, what you have is you have those that represent those artists of touring shows, those that promote that event by taking a financial interest in placing those shows around the country on the tour. And those individuals might engage with a facility owner or operator to place those tours. Each of those have their own business interests, right? Each of those have their own goals and objectives. But primarily, if we talk to the venue operator, their goal is to fill the venue and they have a diverse menu of offerings for entertainment at that venue for the community that they're in. And so what you might see in any given stadium around the country is those three groups engaging in conversations about what events would take place in given markets that make the most sense for A, that marketplace, so it's financially viable for the different entities that I mentioned, that it that is something that would work in that community. There are, there are concerts and events that are certain genres of music that depending on the demographics or the makeup of a certain community may not play certain communities. And so that's, an, that's a very strong consideration in which events come to which venues and why. The last thing is ease and the operational logistical challenge or the elimination of those for these events that take place in different venues. That's what might bring me to some of the roles that I've played in designing venues and some of the experience that I have in uh, sitting alongside my, 
my friends on the architectural side of the table. I am not an architect. Um, going through some of the operational logistical channels that happen in venues that are purpose built for one activity, but used for different activities, such a football stadium, having a concert, a sporting event, or I'm sorry, an entertainment event. So some of those challenges are mitigated by simple things like infrastructure needs such as power, um, lo the logistics that we've talked about and we'll go through, such as imagine what a concert looks like in its concert form and how long it takes to put that together and what, what carries that from one city to the other and the logistical coordination that occurs. I'm gonna go over that in a little bit. And so much of the designs of newer facilities, those within the last, honestly, within the last 20, 25 years, have started to become multi-use oriented in their design, in their DNA. Are they purpose-built for that? Not necessarily. Can they accommodate? Yes. Well, these venues that are designed as such, many aren't, and that's why I still have a job. So let's go through some of the things that happen on an event day for a concert. And along the way, I'm just gonna try to highlight some of the things that I know from other projects and I'm sure you all are thinking are areas of concern for those that would be affected. So one thing, going back to those three groups that I've mentioned, the artist representative, the artist representation team, the production team, and the venue management team, they're engaging in a, an exercise of filling dates. What tour is available? What tour will play in a certain market and be successful? And which venue can accommodate the needs of that tour? Those needs are pretty well prescribed. The needs of tours in a stadium are field protection, stage, floor seating, sound and lighting. Stadium doesn't have sound and lighting for a concert, so that has to be brought in. As you go through that in your mind, imagine that there are 10, 12 tractor trailers, 53 foot trailer semis, carrying this equipment from one city to another as they tour the country. The coordination of those, there, think about that for a second. There's no way we're unloading 53 trailers at the same time. And it would be quite the mess to try to unload all of those when the equipment may not be sequenced in the order that is needed to build the stage or erect the sound and lighting. So much of what happens with the venue team and the production team is the coordination and the identification of pieces of equipment that, res that are carried within a certain vehicle and the coordination of that vehicle arriving in order in the sequence to build the stage. So one concern that I have always heard and I'm sure um, is, is front of mind here is where are these 10, 12 trucks going to be located? Well, what happens in a stadium like this or in convention centers around the country that are also doing different types of shows is the staging and the coordination of those vehicles off-site so that they arrive onto the stadium proper loading dock area where the loading and the unloading occurs directly onto the stage or field location where that stage is going to be erected. That coordination is done by um, the team that is the production touring group and the venue management team. It's a well-orchestrated exercise. Um, in my experience, I can, I can name venues in this market that have done that. You'll see that happening at Soldier Field. You'll see that happening at McCormick Place, where many, many vehicles are delivering equipment and material, material to the site, but it's impossible for them to all be on the site at the same time. So that coordination is well-established in this community of production and venue managers. Um, that typically, so just to give you some timeline, that typically will occur the day before a show. So let's assume we have a hypothetical concert on Friday night. Concert will take place at 7 p.m. Those vehicles and that coordination will begin sometime Thursday morning. It takes about 20 hours for that entirety of those trucks to be delivered, assembled, prepared, secured, tested and ready for use sometime on Friday afternoon when there is a sound check. Sound check is when all of that is tested and all of that is put to use as it would be used during a concert two or three hours later. Concert takes place. 
you know what happens. It's a lot like a football game. You'll have the attendees arriving, uh, the, the patrons enjoying the show, the show commencing. At, upon their departure, the reverse happens. And this happens a lot quicker. Um, there's, a, there's a vested interest on behalf of the touring show uh, to move on to the next city. As you can imagine, uh, they try to sandwich together as many of these stops as possible where they make money uh, and try to minimize any inefficiencies in their transportation setup breakdown. And so the out normally happens something less than 20 hours, about 18, 15 hours is what you'll see all that equipment leave. And it leaves in the complete reverse order that it went in. Um, I left out something I wanted to talk about, and that is during the concert, um, I'm sure we've seen the movies where there are tour buses and all kinds of activities happening on the tour buses that I don't know anything about. Um, those There's really only three to five buses that the tour will have at the stadium, and these typically would be in the loading dock area during the show. Those three to five buses carry the artist and it's a very close entourage or very close bandmates. The remainder of the buses are parked somewhere out, outside, off site. And as you can imagine, um, in many venues, picture a venue with thousands of, of parking spaces on site, um, it is cost prohibitive to use those spaces nearest the venue for service or for logistical needs. Those are taken off site in almost all cases. There's some marshalling or there's service yard somewhere offsite within remote driving distance and utilizing the closest spaces to the venue for patrons, for attendees of the venue. So just, just to help kind of put that into perspective, that that's prime real estate. And so those vehicles won't be on the site and typically aren't. Um, so, right. So in going through the logistics of how an event is procured, how an event is sourced by the venue management team, the day, to, the, the three days of activity that occur at the venue. Um, by many estimations, it's a lot like a football game, a lot like a sold out football game. The stadium as it's designed is scheduled to hold something in the order of 27 to 30,000 seated for a concert, um, I believe that's below the number that a college football game will see. Um, yes, primarily these will occur uh, evenings, um, Fridays and Saturdays are the prime dates for, for these types of shows. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, it is a, a day in, a day for the concert and a day out. No, not necessarily. So immediately after the concert, there'll be activities in that evening, um, but but it's it's reduced in in the amount and the volume. Sorry. Okay. I think I think I I think we're ready. If if you'd like to go into questions. Yeah. I think I'm ready. I think we're ready to go ahead and answer questions. Happy to. No. Um, yeah, so that's been very informative because um, one of my first questions was, in fact, about um, all those trucks that are going to be coming with all the equipment for the to set up for the concert. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, so presumably the trucks, once they've unloaded, will go maybe someplace like Old Orchard or, or some, you know, they'll be off site. Um, OK, um, but, but let's talk a minute about the, the post concert, because the artists need to get on the road and with all their equipment very quickly. So is there is unloading and, and tear down or whatever immediately after the concert and it goes into the into. I'm just wondering how how noisy is that going to be for nearby residents? As to the level of noise, I, I couldn't speak to that, but it will occur immediately after the concert. Um, there'll be the um, the artists will depart, um, and there's a lot of equipment that will be in that loading dock area loaded into those. There will be two or three vehicles, two, two, two or three tractor trailers st stored mm -hmm. in the loading dock to begin to accept a lot of that initial equipment. Mm -hmm. Primarily, the biggest 
uh, effort after a concert is the cleaning of the of the venue, all the trash and debris from the patrons, mm -hmm. the, the dismantling of the chairs and things, mm -hmm. the dismantling of the stage itself mm -hmm. to allow for a lot of that equipment that has taken 18 hours to load up mm -hmm. to be taken down. Mm -hmm. So there's a there, that's why that gentleman's question about how soon and how late into the evening. Right. There wouldn't be an immediate rolling of trucks mm -hmm. after the concert into those wee hours of the morning mm -hmm. because of the work that's being done within the stadium and that there are sta there are trucks staged mm -hmm. for that purpose mm -hmm. to be loaded in the loading dock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um, Would you like me to hold it? No, no I got it. So um, because we do have a noise ordinance that would say, you know, you know construction activity, which I think this is what would, that would qualify as um, needs to not happen after five or six p.m. So I'm, I'm just, I just am interested in whether whether the noise level from whatever teardown activity is, you know, whether that would be in violation of our noise ordinance. And I know that's maybe not easy for you to answer, but yeah. No, so that we we are not. The industry isn't um, unfamiliar with ordinances, noise ordinances, and even vehicular traffic ordinances. Mm -hmm. Um, th those are workarounds, and those are things that when the venue manager is sourcing a tour, they go through with the production team and they work through those those particulars or in individualities. Mm -hmm. So it's not this it's it's not unfamiliar to to these entities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the groups that are potentially likely to come to um, the Ryan Arena, um, could we expect that they're going to want to have um, pyrotechnics? There, there are show, there are theatrical elements to, to the concert uh, presentation, mm -hmm. but but typically it's within within the the, the stadium proper. Mm -hmm. um, I I couldn't speak to the the the, the production or the, the theatrics that an individual artist would have, and whether or not would be up above the stadium. But if you if you think for a minute that those that paid to be part of that performance or 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 experience that are inside the stadium, uh, it's more than likely that any presentation of that experience is happening in the stadium, not not outside. Right, yeah. And is another normal part of a setup having the large video screens so that um, everybody in the audience can see the artists uh, close and, and personal. More and more every day, right, and it's right. behind the, right. behind above the stage. Right, right? yeah. Um, so I, I have some concert-related questions, but I'm not sure this is you know your expertise but so for example um concert goers today like to ho hold their cell phones up and basically you know tape the whole the whole yeah. thing and so you know if we had 28,500 attendees and they're all using their cell phones and so I guess I'm just wondering is there extra um, attention being paid in terms of the design of the stadium to make sure there's enough cell cell reception because we, um, we, we wanted to address that. Okay, yes. sure. Great. Thanks. I get to talk later too, but I'll go ahead and interject. <laughs> okay. So what we're currently doing with the design team is working with all the existing cell carriers that are on site to make sure that we can integrate them back into the new Ryan field. And the other thing is we're doing an enhanced Wi-Fi distribution within the stadium. So there's even greater coverage. Mm -hmm. So you're not only doing the fan experience sort of thing that you're talking about, you know, the lights. But also that emergency service cell phones of reception that you would want right. in a venue like this. Great, yeah, that's very important. Uh, maybe stay one more time. Okay. Um, so, um, and then the other question was whether there's going to whether there's going to be a need for uh, extra power generation. I mean, will you will there be enough uh, electricity supplied normally in the stadium, or will you need to bring in generators or anything during a concert for the ex extra show or anything like that? <laughs> yes and yes. So okay. yes, the stadium is being designed so that it can be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. But the trends are that you just know, never know. And so there are instances where a uh, gen set or a portable generator mm -hmm. is brought. So there are obvious concerns, and this is important. It's not just, it's a, imagine that the artist is also intimately engaged and involved in the noise for their performance, right? So that generator would affect them and the performance and the experience of the guests. So oftentimes we seek generators that have some sound attenuation or some 
some buffer buffering of sound within the within that unit and they are available they're costly mm -hmm. but when those issues are important they're they're available for for use right. yeah well the, obviously that would be important for the artist but it's also important for the nearby residents so uh, they don't hear a, a generator you're absolutely right and yeah. so i'm just um, sure i'm just highlighting the fact that you have two parties that are actually in, in this, of the same mind in, right. in that scenario right okay um i think let me see if we've gotten everything uh you talked about the sound checks yes so is that like all afternoon no or? No, 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 thank God. Uh, if anyone's been through that, it's a it's an experience. Um, no, that that occurs four ish, five o'clock and 20, 30 minutes of, of sound check. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's not uh, it's not like a performance level of sound. Mm -hmm. it, it is it is testing different areas within the microphones and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's much, much um, the lower um, volume and, and, and it's different than the performance. Right, great. Okay. Um, well, I think those are all the questions I have at the moment on concert operations. So, Dave, can I turn it over to you for our, our next topic? Thanks. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Darren, you're back up, my friend. Um, so our next section that we're going to go over is acoustics and noise, um, but we're bringing up our sound expert as well as our design expert. Look, I, I'm used to being interrupted by my children and wife, so that's a sign from God right there. But anyway, so I'm going to quickly introduce you to, and if you can come up here and get started with your presentation, um, they're, they're in. I'm going to try to read through this. There's a lot of text here. Let's just say you're a really smart dude, okay? Um, so you spent 26 years career at HNTB. You focused on collegiate athletic projects, including D1, Power 5 stadiums in Illinois, Nebraska, Kentucky, South Carolina, among others, and most recently led the MLS project at lower.com for the Columbus crew. HNTB is one of the leading architectural engineering and planning firms embracing the culture of creativity, sustainable, sustainable design and cutting edge technology to offer design solutions that are authentic, creative and reflective of the unique character of his clients. I just did a commercial for HNTB, you owe me a check. Um, Greg, Greg Hughes has worked for Wright, Johnson and Haddon and William Incorporate for over 20 years. I don't look that old, my friend. Um, as the lead acoustics expert at the firm and as an expert in sound assessment, sound measurement and monitoring, noise reduction assessment and noise mitigation. WJHW is an industry leader in acoustics, noise control, sound system. I'm not doing a commercial for you. You work for a wonderful firm. You're a smart guy. I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to take it over. Here's your mic. Uh, so the idea for this meeting is that uh, residents were invited to send me questions in advance, and we have a lot of information to cover this evening. So uh, I was we're not planning to have um, questions from the audience. Um, so that's that's my answer, I guess. Hey, um, thank you again. My name is Greg Hughes, and I work for Wrights and Johnson Haddon and Williams. We are. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not much of a performer. I do acoustics, but um, so we are an acoustical consultancy. We've worked on a lot of uh, pro and uh, collegiate stadiums, we've done a lot of these assessments. And so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about what we've done, um, what we're doing, and some of the results of, of these assessments. So um, as part of our due diligence, uh, we've looked at the uh, acoustics of the community by starting with an assessment of having boots on the ground with sound level meters to do um, measurements of what the ambient levels are. So background noise, that might be trucks, it might be ambulances, it might be air conditioners, it might be any birds, crickets and so forth, anything that is um, considered consistent in the environment. Uh, we were out there to do noise measurements and find out. The measurements were made on both game day and non-game day uh, times over a weekend. So Friday night um, through Sunday night. And 
uh, we did measurements across various areas. Um, we did measurements in the parking lot of the existing uh, Ryan Field um, Stadium. And then we also did spot measurements throughout the neighborhoods during game day and non-game day events. Um, it was important that we did both. Uh, we needed to understand how loud the stadium is currently, as well as how what the ambient levels are, what we're experiencing in the community. Um, and it is important to make sure that we get into the residential areas as well. Um, we didn't want to do it just on the property, but we got in there to, to help everybody understand, especially those in close proximity to the stadium, um, something comparative that we can use to, to understand these noise levels. Um, our analysis uh, beyond that, we started looking at the stadium itself and how much noise is generated in there. Um, and we use a program called CADNA A, which is an industry standard environmental prediction, um, noise prediction software. So we understand uh, that there are inputs in there that are going to you know, provide some uh, output of how loud it is around the community in the vicinity of the space under different conditions. Um, our process is, is very iterative. Um, we start with the base building design, we look at it, we do analysis, and then we figure out what the problems are, come back, try to solve those problems, run the analysis again, and repeat that process until we're satisfied. Um, all the adjustments are made based off the results and are intended to improve the uh, experience for those in the community, as well as maintaining good conditions for the, um, the entertainers and for the university. For concerts, because I think that's what most people are interested in here, um, just a real quick understanding of what kind of uh, inputs what we're putting in there. Um, we start with the sound level of the system. How loud is it at the, the soundboard, which is pretty common um, is to measure. The reason we do it there is that's often where somebody can monitor how loud it is. And if there's an issue, they can deal with it at the soundboard specifically, as opposed to having somebody run around and try to fix it. Um, so at the soundboard, we're assuming about a 102 dBA level, all right? And that's very common for most touring acts uh, in venues of this size. Uh, it can give or take a little bit, but that's a pretty common level. Um, we wouldn't get too much louder than that. Um, we've also put in a line array, Again, very common for this type of venue. Uh, the line arrays, the top of that line array is at 56 foot above the stage level, uh, which is, again, a very common industry practice to get that up high enough that it can see all of the audience, get all this different seats um, without, without obstruction. We also used a frequency spectrum that is consistent with peak levels of a pop concert uh, entertainer. So this is that's a pretty broad term, but we're not looking at electronic dance music at the moment. We're looking at pop music, which is, again, probably one of the lar larger um, types of music that would come through this type of venue. Having said all that, all those inputs, um, we've run our analysis. Uh, we do have some numbers to share with you, um, but we work with the owners and the architectural design team to make sure that we get the proper attenuation in, into the stadium design, um, that they understand how the stadium is supposed to work, uh, what the limits are and, and so forth. Um, and then we go on to implementing these solutions through the rest of the process. Our intention is to work and identify, uh, work to identify and evaluate solutions that are you know, appropriate for all interested parties, including the community. Um, and that's what we really strive to do. We want sound attenuation um, that enhances building so that the community is um, satisfied and, and not disturbed. So using that CADNA A program um, and those inputs that I described, we've come up with uh, some values. Now to start off, we just want to talk about what, what we did, uh, what we measured on site. So this is Actual measurements, we took a sound level meter out there and found out what the ambient levels are. Daytime weekend ambient sound levels in the community surrounding this. So these are our spot measurements and, and our fixed areas um, are about 60 to 65 dBA. These are average levels. It's what we call the equivalent continuous noise level. 
um, LEQ. It's the average noise level. So there are some fluctuations. It could be higher at times, it could be lower at times. But generally speaking, the 60 to 65 dBA is the, the noise level one would experience walking through the neighborhood there. During a game day, and these, since we have a, uh, football games that we could measure, we went out and did additional measurements during a game day weekend. And we found that during game day activities um, on the university property, we were about 70 plus, a little bit, uh, you know, 70 to 75 dBA on the property. Um, as we moved out in the community, further away from the stadium, that noise level dropped, it decreased, and we were getting around 65 dBA, um, not, not terribly higher, um, but mostly 55 to 65 dBA in that area. Um, this is in the community. These were on streets, street corners, and public right-of-ways. Um, but it's very similar to what you would expect from the ambient levels. All right, that's not to say that it's not. I'm sorry. I... Yeah. So. Okay, we'll 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 get back to those questions in just a moment. I appreciate it. Um, so what it what it's saying is it's not that the, the game day is inaudible, but it falls within the range of the ambient levels that are currently experienced out there. We then use the CADNA program to come up with uh, noise levels, uh, you know, in the vicinity of the stadium. Those levels were found to be between 55 and 75 dBA uh, under, you know, mostly on the community pro property around the stadium. Um, and it falls off as it gets further away. So we're getting down into the 55 area, you know, blocks away from the, the stadium. Now, these are all very highly dependent on, on various configurations of the system, noise, sound level in the stadium and so forth. So there is quite a big range and we were still in iterations to see, you know, how we can improve this or what the levels are um, under specific conditions. So the average uh, concert activity noise level that we've determined for the community immediately around it, again, is 65 dBA. That is not inaudible, but is similar to the ambient levels frequency wise and so forth. We're still working on that, um, but that is the level that we are uh, predicting based off of the inputs that we have found. There are averages for these types of venues and uh, there's still some, some work that we are looking to do. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Darren who is going to talk about some of the impacts or some of the architectural elements that we've designed in the building. Thank you, Greg. So as far as how's the architecture support what we want to do here, there's foundational things that can be done right away. Size of your venue, location of that venue, uh, what the venue is made out of, and how do you do the electronic sound system within that venue. So think, I'll do it comparatively. Existing Ryan Field um, right now is 47,000, over 47,000 fans. The new Ryan Field will have an occupancy of 35,000. So 32,000 seated positions, 35,000 open and occupants. So you've got 12,000 less fans there already. Um, its location, the field right now is just slightly below grade level. It is now going to be lowered to over 20 feet below grade. So now you're taking that source of that sound and bringing it down into the earth. Uh, the existing Ryan Field has almost no exterior skin surrounding it containing that sound. The new Ryan Field has an enclosure on all sides. Sorry. Enclosure on all sides, and it also has a canopy to help contain that sound. And the last thing is that the sound system within the existing Ryan Field is what's called a clustered design. You have a lot of large speakers at the scoreboard trying to throw sound. I'm sorry. Um, trying to throw sound at the fan. Am I over here? Okay. How about now? That's a little bit better. Um, what we're going to do in the new Ryan Field is we have a distributed sound system. So those speakers are ringing that canopy and pointing directly down to the field and the fan as opposed to pointing out into the community. So those four major things are the first steps in mitigating any sound control that we need to have. And just to um, elaborate a little bit more, lowering that, that field level below grade. Um, essentially cuts the 
area that's not going to expand out of the stadium in half. By lowering it, you're going through seating, you're going through dirt. That is not allowing sound to get out. So we've narrowed the aperture to which sound can get out of the stadium. Um, same with the, sem the enclosure around the perimeter. So that which sticks up above grade, again, narrows that aperture, limits the amount of sound energy that can escape from the, the uh, seating bowl out into the community. Uh, further to that effect is also the canopy, which again puts a, 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 a lid to, uh, you know, around the, the seating areas um, that helps contain some of that sound. Some of it is going to reflect off of that and come back into the seating bowl as a opposed to going out to the community itself. So those things will help, and those are being integrated um, to, to help ensure that as little sound gets out of there as possible. Not no sound, but as little sound. Um, as Darren mentioned, we also are working with the distributed sound system, which, uh, you know, as, as we know, the further we get away from a sound source, the quieter it becomes. So when you have to, fire across a 400 foot field to make sure that you hit the, the uh, spectators on the far end, you have to turn that way up, much higher. Distributing a sound system brings all those sound sources closer so that we don't have to turn it up quite as loud. So we're not introducing as much sound energy into the uh, stadium first off. Therefore, it's gonna be less coming out. So what, what it could be as much as 20 dB lower, uh, depending on how far it has to be thrown. You know, if we're talking 400 feet versus 30 feet, we could get over 20 dB reduction, you know, administratively simply to, to, to make, um, to, and still serve all of the, um, the people in the stadium. There are opportunities also to utilize that distributed system in a concert. So as opposed to all speakers on the stage having to fire all the way to the back corners, you could distribute some speakers and, you know, what we call fill speakers would help uh, in, you know, maintain the sound level that would be coming from the stage, but doing it in a more efficient way that we don't have to introduce as much sound energy into the state, uh, the stadium, and the, therefore the community. Um, stage orientation and speaker directivity um, are, are more architectural elements. Um, we are still looking at those and, again, trying to do everything we can to uh, limit the impact of noise on the community. I can't speak to that right now. Okay. So I guess in concert with the acoustical design, you know, the, the design team overall and you and the other stakeholders have not looked at it as just as one problem. Just as, how about this? Okay. Apologize. We haven't looked at this as, as just an acoustical problem. There's also other opportunities that need to be addressed with this project. One of them is sustainability. This will be a lead gold facility. How that connects to acoustics, the reduction in size of this facility and how we sited it on the property itself allowed for a lot more green space, a lot more permeable uh, surfaces to collect stormwater. We are actually, we're going to contain more stormwater when we're done here than we do in the existing Ryan field. That's very important. So now we're taking aspects for the acoustical design and finding other opportunities that even enhance the development even further. Um, other things that we've done, you know, the, the, the light pollution. We talked about the canopy and that's where the sound system is gonna live. It is also where the lights, the sport lighting for this facility is gonna live. Right now you see the light on poles and you have light leakage onto the other property. Now all that sport lighting will be underneath that canopy, focused straight down on the field, where the field of play where it does its most good, and you don't have the light pollution into the community. So that's how these things are all interconnected. And the other opportunity that this gave us was to not just look at this facility from an accessibility standpoint, but from a universal design standpoint. People are familiar with the term ADA. Those are minimum requirements. We are taking the approach we are not looking at minimum requirements for this project. What else can we be doing? And so the orientation and putting that field 20 feet below, what did that do? It allowed every spectator to come in at grade. You don't have to climb a ramp. You don't have to climb stairs. You are coming in at grade. You know, a typical grade for ADA is one to 12. So one inch rise over 12 inches. Our maximum slope on this site is one to 50. 
Most of them are one to 100, very slight slopes, easy approach. What that allows us to do is now we have accessible seating and companion seating on all four sides of the bowl, both at the main concourse and upper concourse. Uh, to further that idea of universal design, uh, vertical transportation. We have elevators throughout the facility, but we've always paired them. That way, if one goes down, you always have one in operation. So that is an element of universal design, thinking ahead of what could go wrong and preventing it from affecting the fans. Um, toilet facilities. We didn't just design the number of toilet fixtures for code. We ex not only exceeded code, but we looked at every quadrant, every quarter of every concourse and said, what is the seating population in that area? What plumbing fixtures and amenities do they need? Points of sale for concessions, but also restrooms. And we made sure those plumbing counts fit that population. And then in each of those quadrants, we have one or two family toilets for those family members that need assistance or need privacy in their in, in their activities. So just I want you to understand that acoustical is one element, but you can take some of those acoustical ideas that we have and leverage them for greater design throughout the facility. I think I may have skipped, you know, yeah, there. I talked about all that, sorry about that. So, you wanna, you have questions? I'm still cracking up here, so. Uh, could you go back to this, um, this uh, sustainability? It, there we go. Um, okay, come around here. Because um, I guess I have to push back on some of these um, points. Um, and since you mentioned stormwater management measures, um, step my on this um, uh, so I understand, and I'm going to read this one, that the new football field will be below ground level, which you've just mentioned, um, and that the design therefore calls for a, a drainage pump that would run 24 seven and um, the construction of a dedicated large discharge sewer into the North Shore Channel for that all that water. So um, I guess I it's it's a surprising uh, element to to this project. Um, and in addition to the noise and the vibration that such pumps could create, um, the question is, you know, how 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 concerned are we that the massive drainage effort that could have could affect groundwater levels, trees, and subsidence in the surrounding area? So has has an impact environmental impact study been done to look at all these issues related to this um, need to pump the groundwater uh, to the channel? We're live. Uh, so I, I heard a few questions in there, so I will try to address them and let me know if I've tried. Let me start with the maybe more of a building related one, that pump system that she's talking about. Yes, there will be two pumps, a redundant system again, right? To make sure that we have backup for the backup um, and it will run 24 seven, but we have located on the event level. So it's below grade and it's within the enclosed area of the stadium. So the sound mitigation is not, we've taken it away from the public space so that you cannot hear it. And we've even done acoustic isolation within the building. So the people that are working in the building don't have to hear that all the time. So that's one of the points. Uh, the other one is the stormwater um, retention on the site. I talked about the permeable surfaces, right? We're adding green space and permeable papers. So less of that stormwater is going off into the street and into the infrastructure for the city of Evanston. Um, we will be collecting that subsurface. It will be in a pipe system going to the channel. That is all correct. Um, that is a solution that was developed in concert with the city of Evanston. And we are on behalf of the city of Evanston starting conversations with MWRD on the execution of that. So it, right now, every entity is in support of that direction. We have a lot of details to do yet to make it final, but that is the direction we're heading. So it was that, um, yeah, I think that was pretty much, I mean, I guess, um, so basic, basically, um, you're you're needing to um, deal with um, stormwater, or is it groundwater, or both? Both. Right. Yeah. We yeah. As we depress into the into the earth, we do have groundwater issues. We also have stormwater issues. Right. So how do you make efficient systems so it can handle both of them, both the problems? Right. And we found an efficient way to do that. So. Right. Okay. So are you going to do an environmental impact study though related to that? Because just I mean I I I just I. 
I am not a hydrological person, but uh, I just wonder whether, you know, what would be the impact of um, pumping groundwater away from the site for? Well, I think that would be a, an issue to take that we'll need to address with MWRD. It's mm -hmm. really where we're discharging is their right. prerogative. So it'll be whether they feel that an impact uh, study will need to be done. So right. we would be we we would have to support that in mm -hmm. what we're doing. Right. But well, it's really up to them. Right. Well, I, I assume MWRD will be concerned about the, the the quality of the water that gets dumped Absolutely. into the channel. And I know you I know you've got a hydro. I, there's a fancy term for what you've got there. We have a geotechnical engineer. Okay. Is that what you're trying to? No, there's oh. a, there's a a thing at the end of the pipe that cleans the sediment. Yes. Um, but anyway. Yes. Um, but I'm I'm wondering about the environmental impact to the immediate area around the stadium is what is what I'm asking about. Steve, do you have any? Steve Himes, University. Um, so again, we're working with the geotechnical engineer yeah, yeah. On, on the project to assess the groundwater impact. Okay, all right. Um, so just a couple of other items on your chart here. Um, uh, where do we go? Oh, so in terms of uh, reduced carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, um, the the new stadium will be built of concrete, which has a really big carbon footprint. And so I just think that should be noted on, <laughs> on your list of sustainability issues, because that's, you know, that is a huge thing. Yes. And, and so we're looking at other materials to offset. I don't know if I'm holding this side. I'm right. sorry about that. Yeah. We're looking at all materials that we're using to offset that mm -hmm. and have an equilibrium with the design of the mm -hmm. project. Okay. So. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, back to my, I guess, my sound questions. Um, so, turn around and face the other. I don't want to be too close to the mic, though. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, so you mentioned um, the um, the distributed uh, speaker system, and so um, but my understanding is that the the artists who come bring their own sound systems, and so they wouldn't necessarily be using this distributed system, which is very appropriate for. Um, the announcers during the football game and everything, but I'm just questioning whether the distributed system is really what you're going to be taking advantage of in the in the concerts. I, I can't speak for every um, event, but we have used that type of uh, distributed system in large stadiums, um, AT and T Stadium down in, in Dallas, Texas, in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota Vikings, and so forth, where they plug into the uh, the house sound system mm -hmm. to help do the fill for the so it, it is for concerts for concerts mm -hmm. all right okay um all righty uh okay um and then the other another design feature the canopy and um so it's my understanding that sound waves especially low frequency sound waves which are what we're talking about when we've got the instruments um related to a concert um that those easily travel through building structures. Um, and so it's unlikely that the canopy over the seating would really do much to contain the sound from a concert. Um, so I just, you know, if, if you have any comments. Well, uh, your comments are correct. Mm -hmm. However, um, we're narrowing that aperture as was mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, so there's less area for that to get out. We are not suggesting that the building shell itself is containing all sound in there. I mean, we have openings in the stadium. Sound is going to make it through. The intent is to limit the amount of energy that makes it out. Right. And those are the elements that are being implemented right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I have several uh, residents in the seventh ward who had no idea we had such great sound expertise in the community. And so I've been learning a lot about um, what goes into measuring sound. And um, so... So, and they've, you know, combed through the sound assessment, the environmental assessment on the website. And um, so they noticed that um, you, the, it used the, uh, an A weighting rather than a C weighting. The C weighting, which would measure the um, sound from the low frequency sound that you get from a kick drum, a bass guitar, a synthesizer, et cetera. So are, are you, I, I believe we've asked you that you go back and do a, a a further analysis to tell us what, what it would look like with a C weighting. Yes, and that analysis has been completed and um, is part of an updated report. Okay, and can you tell us anything about what you 
learned from doing that? Um, there's low frequency sound <laughs> and um, there is low frequency. Can you hear me now? Um, there is low frequency sound. There's no doubt with concerts. Um, we have not been had a chance to get through a lot of that, um, but that has been updated mm -hmm. and included in the report. Okay, and then we, we did have a question from the audience about, because there's the picture, the, the drawing in the report that shows basically all the all the sound going over to Wamet. And so um, are you, which is clever, <laughs> but um, so are, will you will you show us, you know, what the sound impact is, you know, for the whole surrounding area? I mean, I, 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 or why, why did it end up showing so much of the bad sound going over to Wilmette? Well, there's, um, there's a couple things going on. So we're trying to protect those that are closest mm -hmm. from the most direct sound, mm -hmm. all right? And we're taking advantage of distance to Willamette. There's, and there's also buildings and other things that block sound. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're taking advantage of those. Um, and mm -hmm. that's, okay. you know, th there's, there's other ways that we can look at it. We can, we can, Look at in the round. We can look at how the speakers are pointed and so forth. But the the idea of facing it northward mm -hmm. is not to send all the sound to Will Met. Right. You know, it's to take advantage of the distance and the buildings and other mm -hmm. infrastructure that we have in the stadium to help mitigate right. sound. Right. And and the the a stage itself within the stadium would be basically facing to the north. Is that, yes, under is the current part of, part analysis, of yes. Right, okay, yeah. Um, what was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently they want to see us. I, I, yeah, there we go, fair enough, fair enough, yeah, okay. Um, I did have a couple more little questions here. Um, so I, I think you mentioned um, that we would do sound readings um, at the soundboard. Uh, and that we try to like set a, a maximum sound level at the soundboard. Is that that's pretty common? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, because, um, well, I, I guess I have I have my concert sound experts who say that the artists are going to want to have the sound be as as loud as they think it needs to be to for the concert goers appreciation and. They they may not be happy with um, they may they may want the sound level to go beyond what's at the soundboard or what whatever the level was at the, the, the soundboard. Um, so I, this might be a question for Northwestern. Um, so would um, if, if we set a sound level that had to be observed at the soundboard, and if the concert exceeded that, um, would would Northwestern be should we impose a significant fine on Northwestern because the because the artists are gone they don't they don't care what 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 the what the penalty is so I don't it's it's just it's a funny question but I, 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 yeah. yeah I would just simply say thank you Eleanor and thank you whoever asked that question so City Council actually has a prerogative to determine what fines are with Northwestern University. So that's something that would be debated among the city council. And obviously Northwestern University would follow the laws and we would certainly work with our promoters and the artists to ensure that they're following the local laws in the Evanston community. There's probably other things that we can do um, from a sound mitigation standpoint to keep that sound as contained as possible within that space. But again, this is why as part of our text amendment, we said that we are gonna create a working group and working committee so that we can put together policies in place before we even have our first concert, which if everything goes as we've proposed, that first concert wouldn't happen until 2027 anyways. And so we'll have time to work these through, but if the city council decides that they wanna impose a significant fine to serve as a deterrent for artists, then that's something that you can certainly consider. And I, I'm not sure the university would push back against that in any significant way. So, right. answer the question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and then, I, as I mentioned, I do have some residents who really, really studied your report, and um, they noticed that it's based on information from Henderson Engineering, and yet 
and so they've asked for that data. Is that something that you can provide to, to Dave that he could pass along to these curious residents? Yeah, I don't see why we can't provide right. that. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, they truly have been asking. No, but then, so, right. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Yeah, okay, I, I probably have more here, but I think we'll move on to our third topic. Second, where's my cheat sheet? Mm -hmm. There you go, Peter. And I'll stand over here so we don't have the microphone confusion. So Peter is an Evanston resident. You probably saw him before. He presented at one of our virtual sessions. Uh, Peter has over 25 years experience focused on traffic engineering and multimodal transportation planning with Kimberly Horn in Chicago. In that time, he's worked with the Chicago Bears, the Cubs, Fire, and various projects, as well as Centennial Plan for Navy Pier. Peter has also worked with the city of Evanston and has been an Evanston resident again for over 20 years on this project. Kim Lee Horn is also supported by SP Plus Game Day, who currently manages and operates game day parking and shuttle service from Northwestern University, as well as the public parking garages and lots for the city of Evanston, providing additional local experience and local parking conditions. It's all yours. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening. Um, again, Peter Lemon with Kim Lee Horn. Um, we've been working with the university and the project team as part of the, you know, looking at the transportation related aspects of the project. Get on under the speaker. And um, uh, all right. Is that better? Oh. Uh, so I'm going to take a few moments. I know I think this is the last of the, the sections, um, but I'm sure something everyone's still interested in. Um, so I'm going to take a few moments to walk through some slides and talk through. A uh, couple of things first about what are event conditions at Ryan Field mean in terms of transportation, um, football games, which we're generally familiar with, and then concerts, which would be something that's new. Uh, capacity, time of event, attendee origin. Um, so capacity, I think it was talked about earlier, the size of the stadium now uh, will be reduced for football games and then concert events. Uh, what we've been working for it is 28,500 for a capacity concert event. Um, let me stand further up. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Third time's the charm, hopefully. Uh, time of event. Um, football games tend to happen around noon or 2.30 on a Saturday, sometimes Saturday nights. Uh, and now, as we know, with the Big Ten, potentially, you know, some other uh, Thursday night games potentially coming up, but um, concert events typically in the evenings, uh, seven o'clock, seven thirty, something like that for a start. Um, they could be a weeknight or it could be a Friday or Saturday night. Um, and then attendee origin. So origin for football games. We've got people locally uh, in the community as well as the Chicago area who are here for you know, Northwestern fans, as well as visiting teams. And then a lot of visiting fans from outside of the community, outside of the region who are new to the area and don't, don't fully understand the area as much. Concerts are gonna be more Chicago area market, local market in the Chicago area, uh, a little bit different of a traffic profile in terms of how they're gonna to choose to get to concerts. Um, not, all, not all events are the same. So it's gonna vary um, based on, for concert events are gonna vary based on the performer who is a performer generates different types of demographics. Some types of events will have a demographic that is more interested in riding transit. Some are gonna be more auto oriented. What we typically find is the ones that are a little less transit oriented and more auto oriented tend to have higher vehicle occupancies. So in other words, more people per vehicle um, than say ones that are maybe more transit oriented. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, mode choice and vehicle, well, I talked about mode choice and vehicle occupancy. Uh, so pre-event, um, arrivals are spread out over several hours. So football games, we know that uh, lots start to open up for tailgating three, four hours in advance of a game. That tends to spread out the uh, profile of how people come to games. It's not everyone coming at the same time. It's the same thing for concerts, although for different reasons. There would be no tailgating in the parking lots outside of Ryan Field. Um, but people do, for concerts, tend to go to dinner uh, before shows. It's a very common thing. 
Uh, so that that is one um, kind of decision point. A lot of times, if we've all been to concerts, some people want to go to the opening act, some people don't. Some people want to just show up for the main event, and they start to filter in over time as well. So there's a whole spread of people who are going to dinner, uh, coming for the opening act, coming sometime during the opening act, coming for the main event. And no matter what, there's always people who even show up uh, after the main event starts. Post event uh, departures for football, it's a little bit more spread out uh, related than to a concert. Um, you know, sometimes the game is already decided. People start leaving in the fourth quarter. Sometimes they wait till the end. Sometimes there's tailgating after the game, things like that. It spreads it out. Concerts are a little bit more concentrated, but they're ending later at night. And what we see is the ambient level of traffic at night, say 10, 30, 11 o'clock, is significantly less than what's happening pre-event uh, in the range of 55 to 75% lower traffic volume. So there's a lot of excess capacity at that time to handle that um, more concentrated levels of traffic. Okay, so in terms of how do you get here? So there's uh, car, transit, active transportation, and then limo, black car, private uh, transportation, uh, private shuttles, things like that. So cars, uh, that would probably be the largest uh, single mode share, people who are driving and parking. Roughly 50%, a little over 50% is what we would expect for this venue. Uh, ride share, we see ride share at football games, but not to the level of concerts. We tend to see a little bit more ride share at concert events than you do for uh, football games here. Uh, transit. Ryan Field is uniquely positioned in the Chicago market to leverage transit. Wrigley Field has the red line next to it. That's a great asset for people who go to concerts and games at Wrigley Field. Ravinia has Metra. I assume a lot of us have been to Ravinia. The Metra is a great option to get there. It's right there. Uh, but Metra is the only option to get there via transit. Ryan Field is a couple blocks from both a Metra and a CTA transit line. So that's a significant opportunity for people not to drive uh, to come here, particularly North, South, people coming from the city for a show uh, or the northern suburbs. Um, active transportation, it's not a major percentage of people. There will be people in the community who walk to shows or who are biking to shows. We want to make sure we're accommodating those people. That's important. Um, it's not a significant volume of the people, but things like bike valet stations so that when you ride your bike, uh, you have a place to secure it. Um, you check your bike in, you check it out. You go by football games today, there's not enough bike parking as there is. People are locking their bikes to trees and lampposts and things like that. So that's just a, 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 an element of the design, but not a significant mode share. The other is uh, limos, delivery vehicles. You know, concerts can be a special event for people. They come in groups and things like that. So you have to figure out where those people coming in and, and consider them, but not a major um, contributor in terms of total number of people attending. So the parking plan, uh, a couple of things I want to kind of level set on this. The, uh, the parking plan is distributed. It's different than what you see at a football game now. Um, the only on-site parking are the lots on the east and west side of the stadiums, okay? The other parking in the area is off-site. So there's some parking that could be walkable, like say you park on Poplar by the metro station. Those are public parking spaces. Those would be available. There's roughly 200 spaces there. There might be some uh, businesses in the area that decide to you know, park people in their lots, just like the Evanston Art Center does. But for the most part, the biggest difference in the area is no parking in the neighborhoods. No parking for, it'll be parking for residents and your guests, but in terms of event parking, no parking in the neighborhoods, similar to something like you might see at Ravinia. Um, what this does is it puts more traffic or in parking on campus in downtown spreads it out across the street network of the city. So we're not concentrated. The more parking we have next to the stadium, the more traffic we have coming to the stadium. So it's less centralized and more distributed to broaden the impacts. In terms of locations, I mentioned the east and west lots. It's roughly 1,400 spaces. Nearby offsite, I mentioned Poplar. There could be other lots nearby um, that might decide to partake in selling spaces. Um, and then on campus, there's the North Garage, there's the South Garage, and there's several surface parking lots uh, throughout campus that can be used. And then downtown, uh, we have three city-owned public garages at Maple, Church, and Sherman Plaza. There's other privately-owned parking garages as well. 
that can be uh, utilized and sold for uh, event parking. And then those folks would get to the venue using shuttle buses, uh, similar to how they do today for football games, just in larger volumes, because we have more people parking off, off site, uh, as well as uh, Metra and CTA, uh, which would be, you know, personally, that's how I'd want to get from downtown to just a quicker ride. Uh, here, I'm going to pause this here real quick. Hold on. So what we've got next is a series of slides, uh, sort of animated graphics that start to give a sense of, um, if I can get this one moving. Okay, so it's a sense of what's going on, sort of a time lapse in terms of overall access, circulation, parking, the things that are going on in the hours leading up to a show, during and following a show. So you can see this area is not just focused on Ryan Field, it's the overall uh, part of the community that would start to serve the overall transportation systems for an event. So in the four to five o'clock hour, we're several hours before an event, um, we have uh, neighborhood parking restrictions are active. We have traffic control going up. Uh, the parking along Central Street is stripped so that we have uh, maximum use, just like you would on a football game today. There are certain directional flows that might change temporarily for events, like Ashland next to the stadium becomes northbound. Um, police are positioned at their different posts uh, to manage traffic. Uh, we have recommended 12 different locations or intersections where police would manually control and manage intersections. So that's uh, controlling the traffic signal, sending traffic through as, as queues start to build up, addressing pedestrian safety and crossing uh, conditions. Um, uh, emergency vehicles is another one. We spent uh, four games this last year uh, observing traffic throughout the neighborhood, throughout the area. That was one thing I really wanted to focus on since we have the hospital and a fire station in the general area. Uh, how do they, how do the police manage and handle approaching ambulances and fire vehicles? They do a great job in terms of seeing what's coming, communicating through the intersection as well as downstream intersections so that they can start to hold the intersections, keep them all red so no traffic is going through to keep it clear. Uh, it, was, it was actually very smooth from what we saw. Um, so these things are all starting to happen and you start to get people uh, approaching the stadium and the community. These green dots you'll start to see as we go through represent people coming in early, uh, dining opportunities and things like that. Okay, so the next hour, five to six, we're now say roughly hour to two hours before a show. Um, you start to see, you know, people are coming in on transit. These lines over here represent the different shuttle routes. So right now, this is the shuttle route that we're assuming it's consistent with what is used today for football games. We, you know, feedback on that. We can talk to that and try to figure out if there's a better way to do it. But that's uh, basically people are starting to fill the lots, starting to take the shuttles. They're starting to visit. Uh, they're coming early, going dining opportunities and so forth. Okay, six to seven. So this, this is the peak hour. This is the hour before a show. This is the hour where we'll see the most concentration of traffic and people arriving, people filling the, the lots, people finishing dinner, people starting to make their way to the stadium. Um, you can see that we've got uh, the Metro and the CTA, people walk into the stadium. It's all pretty consistent with the last one. And then we have the seven o'clock hour. So this is where we still have people coming to the stadium, as I mentioned. Not everyone's coming for the opening acts. Some people come in and filter in a little bit later, um, but people are starting to finish their, you know, if they were going out to dinner before, they're finishing up, they're making their way to the stadium. The stadium, the event would start, lots are filling up and shuttles are continuing to bring people uh, to an event. Okay, so during the event, eight o'clock, not a lot's going on at this point. There might be some stragglers still showing up, but for the most part, the neighborhood parking restrictions are still in effect. Police are still at their posts. Um, there's not a whole lot happening, as you can see. The next hour, nine to 10. Okay, so things are still kind of quiet, but things are starting to also get ready for the post-event uh, post um, departures. Um, these little icons represent the idea of ride share, separate ride share uh, staging zones. So today at Ryan Field, people drop off on Central and that generally works pretty well. Uh, the pickup location is actually on Isabella 
in Asbury. It's not a great location. No one wants to walk there to catch an Uber to go home. People start instead walking towards uh, Green Bay Road or they walk towards the L and things like that. And they try to figure out uh, what's going on. We want to have a more organized rideshare situation. And so what we're proposing would be two different locations. And these are just illustrative. But the idea is one east and one west of the stadium. You don't want all that happening right at the stadium. You want to start to spread it out a little bit. So maybe it's the parking lot north of Chandler Newberger. Maybe it's the Haven uh, parking lot. So find an area where vehicles will start to stage and get ready. And then when you're exiting the event, it's just like when you're at O'Hare, it's all geo, it's all geo uh, fenced. So it's only, you can only pick up your Uber or your Lyft at dedicated locations through the app and you're directed to that place. So you walk to those lots and that's where you can arrange to pick up your car. And that's where vehicles can stage waiting for the event to end. You also start to have uh, the shuttle buses start to line up to take people back to the offsite parking locations. And so now that we're now that we're 10 o'clock, you know, the event is wrapping up, people start leaving, you have the shuttle buses picked up, they're all staged, ready to go. Uh, Metra and CTA as well. We've had initial conversations with the CTA and Metra about additional trains added to the schedules, trains ready to go following the event to bring people home. Um, so those things, those conversations are ongoing. Um, but you can see then, you know, we start to empty the lots, we start to bring people back uh, to where they're going. And as I mentioned, the ambient or background traffic volumes at this level at this time are way below levels that they are earlier in the day. So police can just uh, flush people through the intersections. A lot of times they're only changing it for when pedestrians are going because uh, you don't usually have a lot of oncoming traffic. Those, yeah, I'll, we'll address it, but yes, that would be Evanston Police. Um, 11 to 12, same kind of thing. We're just wrapping up. It's, you know, the hour, hour and a half after the show. People are kind of exiting, getting the last shuttle buses. People are making their way back to their offsite uh, parking locations and heading out. So the last thing I wanted to talk about before we get to uh, questions is uh, the transportation management plan. So we've ident identified a series of recommendations, whether it's police, uh, police posts and their roles, uh, temporary changes. A lot of it actually is pretty consistent with a football game today. Um, but nevertheless, those things are all identified in, the re in our report that we prepared. But a transportation management plan is sort of a logistical framework or an operations plan of how these things all get uh, memorialized and then an action plan. So whether it's and it's developed in coordination with the city and different stakeholders. Uh, it identifies some of the key components, like where, where are we making streets one way temporarily? How are, where are we stripping parking? Um, what are the different um, police positions, their roles, the key things that they're doing at each intersection? What are the shuttle bus routes? How many shuttle buses? Um, neighborhood parking, event parking restrictions. Where are they? What are the boundaries? What are the times? How do we handle when someone has uh, a dinner party the night of a concert? And how do we handle like placards so that you can still have guests come to your to your house? Um, what are the controls at the different uh, intersections, say along Central or Green Bay? Do we have sawhorses out there with signs? Do we have other signage out there? How do we, um, where, are, where are the signs and what are the messages as you're approaching the stadium that direct you to on-site parking, if you, uh, which will all be prepaid? or that directs you to offsite parking. Rideshare strategies, communications, uh, all of that would be memorialized in this document. And it's a living, breathing document. So it's not something that would just be developed, sit on a shelf. This is something that would be dynamic over time. So whether it's once or twice a year, uh, the university would get together with, uh, whether it's a stakeholder advisory group, members of city staff review, hey, how did this last football season go? How did this last concert season go? What's working? Is something not working? How do we address that or change it? Put that back into the plan and revise it. Maybe there's emerging technologies. 15 years ago, if we were doing this, we wouldn't really know what Uber and Lyft was. So you gotta be able to evolve and change with it as conditions change and that's what the TMP would do. Um, I think that's, that's it. Uh, Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, well, just to clarify right away, the questions about the police. Um, so it would be the way it is currently for 
uh, football games. Northwestern uh, pays for the police that provide the traffic management. Um, these are police officers who are doing this over during their um, off, off time. So it's not taking them away from their um, regular tours of duty. Um, I will say, however, you know, our, our police force is down a number of positions. And so, um, you know, it, at a certain point, our officers do need to have a rest. So if they're working and then they're doing the concert duty, it, it gets to be gets to be quite a lot. So, um, but but truly, I mean, Northwestern does reimburse, uh, does pay the the officers for their for their time. Okay, um, so uh, so I did a lot of looking at this um, study and crunching the numbers, and um, I missed one number to crunch. Uh, so a resident uh, provided a surprising analysis about the estimated number of concert goers who are expected to take the CTA to the concert. So um, he says the assumption about the number of people who could travel with the CTA, that that number is unrealistic because, so the traffic study assumes that 30% of the concert goers are going to take um, CTA, um, 8,550 people. Um, but he, so he, he looked at they published CTA capacity data and he says it would take nearly six hours of fully loaded CTA trains um, to get 8,500 people to the stadium. I mean, we get a lot of people on the CTA to get to our, Cub, you know, the Cubs game. So I, I just, I don't know if you have any comment. Well, so we can, we can look at those numbers and provide a more formal, like calculated response to that. Um, but just how we came up with that number, maybe is a better way of doing it. And, and, and so there's CTA, if I understand that there's CTA, you know, published CTA numbers for how many people per car and things like that. There's also, um, you know, that's typically for like a typical ride or commute style ride versus say like an event ride where people, I don't, you know, that the, the, the non-technical term is called crush capacity, but but that the idea is we've all been on those trains where, you know, everyone's kind of pushing to get in. And so you're getting probably a lot more people than, than maybe what those statistics would refer to. The other thing is, um, and we've talked with CTA and Metro about this, is um, I mentioned the idea of having uh, trains at the ready, essentially. So it's not the typical every 15 minutes, there's an L train and, you know, every half hour, an hour, there's a Metro train, there's trains ready to go kind of on, on backup. Um, so much more frequent type of service post game, immediately post game or leading up to a game. Um, and then also we looked at Wrigley Field, for example. So CTA is, an, is a parallel um, in 2018. So we were looking at data pre-COVID, what was their kind of transit use? Um, it's in the range of like 25 to 35%. It's also a bigger venue. So they're having, you know, maybe 10 to 12,000 people take the L. Um, there are differences. There's, you know, they're serving two ways. We're primarily going southbound with the L here, but, you know, it's a, it's an estimate. I mean, there, and there's going to be differences for different shows. Um, also, Metro, we had at 10%. And so I think that could potentially be undercounting. Um, we talked with the folks at Ravinia. Um, one of the things, I'll just kind of build on this a little bit, um, one of the things Metro has been doing since COVID has been working with Ravinia so that you don't actually pay for your Metro ticket. You actually just show your event ticket on your phone or whether you bought one uh, and have a hard copy ticket, whoever has those these days, you just show that to the conductor and that's it. You're not paying for it. They have an arrangement with Ravinia where they're counting how many people are using the train and they kind of work on it afterwards. Like what's the reimbursement? But basically that cost is built into people's tickets. Um, right now, Ravinia is doing about 10% Metra, um, but that is uh, that is post-COVID, you know, like in 2021, 2022, and they've been seeing it increase. I'll be curious to see what it is this year, but I would expect that we'll probably get more than 10%. Also, if you're going southbound, you know, you can always take the Metro. I think the Metro is going to have more capacity, and if we have more trains kind of built up, we should be able to handle that. Um, so I think we're kind of generally on par in terms of CT with what Wrigley has, but we'll have multiple options. All right, let's, I, we've got a, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, so the traffic study uh, assumes 52% of concert goers uh, will come by private car. Um, so that's roughly 11,000 uh, concert goers. 
or 11, excuse me, 11,000 of those people will park on campus or in downtown garages. That, that's, uh, I, I, I was pretty, I was pretty, pretty careful here. Um, so 50% of those concert goers, 5,500 people are going to um, take the shuttle to the stadium before the concert. And then more, more of the attendees will take a shuttle after the concert, 85% percent of you know 9,000 plus people will take the shuttle back to their cars after the concert so um, 40 people per shuttle so it's going to take 138 shuttle trips shuttle runs before the concert and 214 shuttle runs after the concert so I just have to say a, a staggering number it is a lot of shuttles uh, it is more than what is a typical football game now so for example the um you know, the Ohio State game this last fall, we saw, I think it was somewhere in the range of 50 or 60, like shuttle um, boarding or cycles after. Um, but, you know, the big difference between football, say historically, and a concert event is that people aren't parking in the neighborhood. So, so people need to park somewhere. Um, and the idea of shuttles is generally a good thing. You know, the challenge is we can double load shuttles, we can rearrange the configuration along uh, Ashland to maybe load shuttles in two separate rows or maybe multiple locations. Yeah, so double shuttle, what is Well, that? Like, like two rows of shuttles so that you're not just waiting at the curb to get on shuttles. There might be two curbs, for example, or there might be multiple locations to pick them up. Um, the idea is that if we have shuttles carrying 40 people, each shuttle represents roughly 15 or 16 cars driving around. So, right. you know, it's more shuttles, but it's less traffic overall. Yeah. Right. No, the, is this on all right? Um, the distributed aspect of this, I think, is is helpful. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to have 9,000 people after the concert who are waiting for the shuttle. So the question is, are they going to all be milling around? Are they well, what are what are they going to be doing while they're waiting for their right. shuttle bus? Well, we'll have I think <laughs> lines, right? We'll have multiple lines and organize for entertainment. <laughs> maybe. Uh, well, that doesn't make noise, no. right? Yeah. Um, but I think multiple lines, getting people organized, and the key is knowing uh, separate downtown shuttle versus campus shuttle. So you start to distribute those on the site where those might be. And think of, um, you know, you're waiting in line at Six Flags or you're waiting in line somewhere. Uh, and then the idea is how do you get as much people through mm -hmm. onto buses at one time as possible? So staging, loading, say potentially 20 buses at a time, mm -hmm. that's roughly 800 people. And then the next round of 20 buses could come in. That's another 800 people. And if we get buses doing two or three cycles, right. then we're able to, to get everybody out within like an hour, hour and a half. Right. Yeah. No, because we, in addition to the number, big number of shuttle runs, we just, we're going to need a, a big number of shuttle buses themselves, even if they make, each one makes two or three trips. Correct. Correct. Um, so I crunch my numbers again, and it sounds like we need between 78 and 117 buses. And so I, I'm wondering if Northwestern would like to invest in a electric bus company so we can <laughs> expand expand the sustainability aspect. I think your numbers are about where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, and but but if we don't have electric buses, um, how is Northwestern going to ensure that those buses are not idling where they're while they're lined up there, double parked, waiting for the passengers so um we can work through that as part of the tmp and the operations plan so whether they're idling or not you know whether they're running while they're waiting for the event to end maybe they're off you know it's it's fine um just like football now um they tend to stage by Leahy park the stage in areas so that there's a communication of like the buses so they're not we don't you know they're going to be organized in sequence just like the trucks would for move in or move out of the of the stage. Mm -hmm. They're also sequenced in different places. We don't want 20 buses waiting and then another 20 buses sitting on central because mm -hmm. then that starts to impact our other traffic flows. Right. So it's sequenced and communicated throughout. Mm -hmm. And then once the first buses start going, mm -hmm. then they're in circulation and they're, the next ones are coming in. We probably have more of a challenge of making sure the next buses are coming in mm -hmm. and there's not a big gap of people waiting than we do of actual buses just backed up waiting. Right. Yeah. yeah, but I would say we, we're definitely gonna need an idling patrol because I, I, I perform idling patrol um, during the football games, and I often have to ask a police officer to go over and tell one of the drivers of the visit of the visiting teams to please um, stop idling your bus. So, yes, sir. 
saying that that's a top a top priority. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Well, so this is now to a, a different part of the proposed zoning amendment, which is the um, uh, proposed uses of the new plaza areas. And so there's um, the proposal would uh, allow an unlimited number of 10,000 person events and 60 days of 7,500 person events on those new plazas that are going to be around the stadium. So I'm just I'm wondering, are you making a parking plan for for those events? I might let them answer how the plazas are used and then okay. how that relates. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, thank you. Um, just to clarify. Yeah. So the current zoning allowance um, for the stadium allows the university university sponsored events, speakers, lectures, um, up to 10,000 in the enclosed area. So we've simply asked the ability to do those university things for university students indoors or outdoors. So that, that piece is okay. basically the extension of the current zoning code. And then we've asked to do something new, which is to activate the plazas for the community. So what we've, I, I think the focus really is the 7,500 up to 60 days a year. And that's what Dave was talking about earlier, sorry. The, um, you know, the festivals kind of over the course of the year, the winter festival, kind of summers, um, and then some of the movie night type activity. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the parking in those two scenarios, parking transportation, those two scenarios, in the first group, kind of the university activity, that's university students for the most part. And so I don't think you're gonna be focused, you're not gonna see a big kind of influx of cars coming to the venue for that. And then, sorry, Dave. And then for the second piece, you know, the university focus, or sorry, the uh, community focus festivals and things like that, primarily you're targeting the community. Um, and with kind of a cap of 7,500 people, the plaza capacity in like the Northwest plaza, uh, plaza you saw up there, you know, that's going to be much lower than the 7,500. We're thinking of over the course of a day, you know, a Saturday afternoon, winter market, kind of people coming in and out well within the 13 to 1,400 spots that we've got on site today. Um, but again, spread out much in the way you think of people coming in and out to like a farmer's market. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think that's the end of my little, my little list about, okay. uh, about parking. Okay. Um, but I did want to ask um, Sarah Flax to come up and clarify one, one aspect of um, Matt Rogers' uh, presentation. Hello, and thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to clarify that the city can approve this, the plan development, the stadium, even if the text amendment is not approved. So that would enable the university to rebuild a stadium. It just wouldn't allow concerts in it. it would, they would be able to do their standard operations now. So we wanted to make that clear, the two um, aspects the special, the, the text amendment and the plan development are separate approval and you can't, or you can't link them together and just say nothing can move forward. Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks Sarah. Yeah, I, I, I was a little confused about that, that part of the presentation. So I'm glad we could, could clarify that. So, um, well, I really thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I, there, were, there was a lot of really important information for all of us, and um, we, I, we, will be, uh, no, we will be having a further special topic um, presentations uh, with Northwestern because there's some, some still some big issues that we've not covered, particularly, for example, um, the demolition and construction process and how that's going to work. So that'll be probably our next, next big topic. Uh, no date yet, but sometime soon. So thank you all very much for coming.